Good morning, brothers, sisters, and friends. It is great to see all of you today. Welcome to the Sunday service of the Central Christian Church. What an interesting month of June it has been. Traditionally, it is a time when a lot of us, especially with school-going children, take a short vacation to rest and recharge for the second half of the year. With the current situation, we are not able to do so physically, but we can certainly take the time we need to recharge ourselves spiritually. For the month of July, we will be doing, digging deeper into the book of John with the quiet time series titled, The Great I Am. To start us off, John Lewis will be preaching today's sermon titled, I Am and I Am Not. In a short while, I'm going to lead us in prayer. If you can, I'd like to encourage every one of us to get down on our knees out reverence for God. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you God that we are grateful we can have you in an anchor in our lives. We are thankful that we can know you and handle life situations better through reading the Bible. Even though we may be physically apart from one another, we can be united spiritually as we embark on the Gospel of John together. We ask that you steal our hearts and help us hear your words today. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right now, we'd like to invite our song leaders to lead us with worship. Fragrance of spring 
Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by Before the song leaders lead us with the next song, Set Apart, I will read from the following scriptures. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2, it reads, You have been set apart as holy to the Lord your God, and He has chosen you from all the nations of the earth to be His own special treasure. Again, in New Testament, we are reminded in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are not like that, for you are chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for He called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. In the eyes of God, we are always seen as set apart for Him. In these verses we read, God reminds again and again, that we are set apart. I hope you will feel the same today. And let us meditate on these verses as we sing to God, set apart. Set apart, set apart born of promise, born of promise. given life.
Boys and lies, we were dying, we were dying. ruin fields, fields. so decay. You reached out from the heavens, you stooped down, made us great. Darken skies, Dark skies over hilltops. One man has torn in pain, set apart for this hour, ransomed us from the grave. Trumpet sound. Trumpet sound, we are gathered, we are gathered. All, those born all those born of his grace, of his grace. set apart, set apart. All by his voice, see him, we'll see him. Face, to face. face to face, we're set apart, Jesus has Thank you, song leaders. The time of circuit breaker has also slowed down the pace of life and given some of our friends studying the Bible time and space to seek after God. For this month of July, we would like to celebrate with our young Christians who made the decision to follow Jesus during this uncertain time. For a start, we will be having an interview with our sister Cindy from the Edge Ministry who was baptized on 24th June. Let's hear what she has to share. Fiona, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm here with Cindy today and we are both from the Young Professionals. Cindy just got baptized last week and I thought it would be good to get to know her a little as our sister in Christ. Before I start, Cindy, would you like to introduce a little about yourself? Yeah, sure. So hi everyone, my name is Cindy. I'm currently working at an early intervention center teaching children mainly with autism. I got to know the community through meetup.com as I joined a creative journaling session that was facilitated by Angie two years ago. So I've always wanted to find out more about the Bible and Christianity to get a deeper understanding and knowledge of my own faith. Um, as far as I can recall, I checked with Angie if she does any Bible study and that is how it all started. Thanks, Cindy. I'm so glad that God opened the doors for you to get to know Angie through creative journaling and to start your journey on knowing about God on a deeper level. So how has the journey of knowing God been for you? Right. Um, so I was actually introduced to Christ um, in primary two by a Chinese tutor and have been curious about his existence since then. Uh, ever since I started studying the Bible with the group, I find myself being more disciplined and setting apart some time to read the words and just spending some quiet time with him during the day more consistently. Um, I think it's really a journey that requires a lot of faith. Yes. It is definitely a journey that requires a lot of faith and discipline in getting time with God daily. I know that you started your Bible study in real life and eventually shifted it to Zoom due to the current situation. What are some interesting Bible study sessions that you've had over Zoom? 
Right. Yeah. So I think each session was always interesting. Um, I find that the elaboration about each of the scenes were very eye-opening. So whenever I feel that I'm not doing the right thing, I will try to pause, reflect, and revert back to the discussion we had before in regards of the sin. So the other one would be probably about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because um, I found myself reflecting a lot during that period of time as I had a different understanding back then. And obviously, we had a lot of fun moments sharing our ups and downs days together and just being vulnerable with each other. Mm, I remember being in a few of your studies and I really enjoyed our time together and learning about the Bible on different topics as well. You mentioned that you started joining about two years ago. So how has the community helped you in your walk with God? Right. Um, so as I recall, I think like last year, I attended a lot of uh, like baking sessions and just um, Bible talks and it, it really encourages me. And I think knowing the community better, uh, I find that some of um, them really take the efforts to just reach out to me. They take the time and their own effort to connect with me through Zoom calls, especially during this period, and just spending the time with me even before the COVID, um, sharing about their own journey, their walk with God, and trying to just um, to know me better. And that really encourages me. I've seen how they've encouraged you and embraced you and um, not just the sisters in your Bible study group, but also everyone in the zone that you've been joining. So mm-hmm. what convicted you to make a decision to be a disciple? Right. Yeah. So I told God that I want to be right uh, with him and just being a teachable person. And that is why I chose the path to become a disciple. Cindy, I've always felt that you have been such a teachable person and I'm really glad that you made the decision to be right with God. Last question before we end, did you have any thoughts of doing your baptism at a later date due to COVID? Why and what made you change the decision? Right. Um, Not really. I've always been thinking about my own salvation. Um, And since I made the decision that I want to be baptized, I told myself that it should not be delayed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm very encouraged that you gave a lot of thought about your own salvation and have that urgency in you no matter the situation. And I'm truly very happy to call you my sister in Christ. Thank you so much for the time today. And I can't wait to give you a big hug when we see each other. Yeah, me too. Bye. 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 <laughs> what a testimony sharing from Cindy. I'm so encouraged by what she has shared indeed. God is amazing and uses people around us, the community to help us draw closer to Him. Now is the time for the sermon, after which we'll be taking communion together. In the book of John, Jesus made many statements beginning with I am, such as I am bread of life in John 6 and I am the light of the world in John 8. Today, we'll be hearing from John Lewis. His sermon title is, I am and I am not. Who are the I am's in this statement? Let us find out from John. Brothers sisters, I present to you, John Lewis. Welcome everybody to our Sunday worship service and to the month of July. In this month, we as a church will be studying the book of John. And I hope by now you've already got the material. And it's really exciting when we can study the same material together as a church. I think, first of all, it gives us something common to talk about during the week. And that's just a great way to stay plugged into the Word and to continue to encourage one another. You know, when you study the book of John, you can't help but come across this phrase. I am. In fact, this phrase was uttered by Jesus all through the book. And here are seven of his I am statements. In chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, verse 7, I am the gate. 
In verse 11, I am the good shepherd. In chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. In chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And finally, in chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. So when you read these statements, I think you can't help but, you know, realize that that's how Jesus wanted to identify himself. And yet each I am statement has a slightly different meaning from the other. There's obviously a lot of overlap, but as you study each of these statements, it'll take you deeper into understanding who Jesus was and still is. Now, there is another statement that's also scattered throughout the book. And it's this statement, I am not. So on the one hand, you have Jesus saying, I am, but there's another phrase that's also used, and it's I am not. So we're going to focus on both these phrases for the whole of this sermon. But first of all, I'm going to talk about the interplay of these two phrases between John the prophet and Jesus. And then later on, we're going to focus on the exact same two phrases between Peter and Jesus. So first of all, let's look at the way John the prophet and Jesus use these phrases. Both the phrases, I am and I am not, by the way, is mentioned about a hundred times in the book of John. Isn't that amazing? And earlier on, right in chapter one, okay, the book starts off with John the prophet saying, I am not the Christ. That's in chapter 1, verse 20. And then in verse 21, he says again, I am not Elijah and I'm not the prophet. Verse 27, I am not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. Then in chapter 3, verse 28, John the prophet says, I am not the Messiah. Now, isn't it interesting that the book starts off with John saying repeatedly, I am not. They asked him, are you the Christ? He said, I'm not. Are you Elijah? I'm not. Are you the Messiah? I'm not. So as he makes his I am not statements, it's as if he's getting all the readers to get prepared to accept the I am statements from Jesus. So is there a lesson here for us when we, when we see how John the prophet used the phrase, I'm not, and then Jesus repeatedly using the phrase, I am. And I believe there is a lesson for all of us just from that. Perhaps the lesson is just this. The rest of us must say, I am not. And only Jesus can say, I am. Just think about that. You know, if you build on that, there is a lesson here on discipleship and on lordship. I mean, let's face it. Who really is the Lord of your life? Can Jesus say, I am the Lord of your life? And can you say, like John the prophet, I am not the Lord of my life? Until you can say, I am not the Lord of my life, 
then Jesus can't say, I am the Lord of your life, or I am the light of your life, or I am the bread of life. You have to first of all say, like John the prophet, I am not. So I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, when it comes to major decisions in your life, or deciding on your priorities. Do you base it on the teachings of Jesus? Or do you just look religious on the outside, but actually in your heart, you make all the decisions based on your own philosophies and on your own preferences and your own likes and dislikes. In other words, you are truly the Lord of your life. But no one else can see it, you see, because no one really knows the basis of your decisions. But if you really allow Jesus to be the I am, then you will take yourself out of the equation. You will say, I am not. And I think the words from John the prophet it is so appropriate when we think about this in terms of discipleship and lordship. You know, come to think of it, many of the sins that the Bible mentions really comes down to this one thing, a desire to please ourselves. Isn't that true? I mean, virtually every sin is a result of us wanting to please ourselves. It's a result of us saying, I am the Lord of my life. I want to do what I want to do. I want this pleasure. I want this experience. I mean, let's go through some of the, the, the sins, evil thoughts. That's a sin. But you know, when we have thoughts that that we allow to get very, very far, when people hurt us, we say what? I want justice. I want revenge. I want to pay back. I want it my way. What about the sin of sexual immorality? Why is that such a rampant sin in the world today? Because behind that sin, what drives, what's the driving force behind that sin? It's this, I want pleasure. I want to enjoy myself. I want to please myself. What about the sin of theft? How does that get translated? Basically, it means this. I want this for myself. I don't want to work for it, but I want it. What about the sin of greed? Basically, it's us saying, I want more money. I want, quote unquote, the good life. You see, so much of the driving force behind each act of sinful nature is an incredible desire to please ourselves. And, and to borrow the words from John the prophet, we would do a lot better in life if we can understand that at many times in the day, we need to use this phrase, I am not. I'm not going to put myself above God. I am not going to enjoy this for my own selfish need. But when you become the I am of your life, then things take a turn for the worse. Because then everything is about you putting yourself at the front. And what happens to your life as a result? It just 
doesn't go well. So, brothers and sisters, I think there's a lesson here on Lordship. We need to allow Jesus to be the I am. Like John the prophet, we need to say, I am not. I am not the Lord of my life. And if you can let that take root in your heart, I think we will be a lot further along in our faith. You know, Making Jesus the Lord of our lives or letting him be the I am is not easy. And you know, one of the things I love about the Bible is this. It never says being a Christian is easy. You know, when you talk to salespeople, they always tell you the good side of a certain product that they want you to buy. Isn't that true? I just got a call arbitrarily from... Uh, from a reputable company and that was talking to me about their insurance products and they were telling me all of the benefits you know? you're going to get this and it even covers COVID-19 it does this and they went through all the benefits and I thought to myself then what's the catch what's the catch usually you won't know what the catch is until you buy and until you face a, a tragedy in your life. Unfortunately, that's the case for a lot of people. But you know what I love about the Bible? It's this. Jesus never said from the get-go that life is going to be easy. That's why I can trust the Christian faith. Jesus is not selling us something where he only talks about all the benefits and the challenges are never highlighted. That's not what it says. When you really understand the I am statements, basically what that means is, Jesus is the Lord of your life through thick and thin. It doesn't matter what happens to you, he is the Lord of your life. And yet for many of us, is he truly the Lord of our lives when we go through a challenge? Or is he just the great I am in good times. I'll tell you one thing I've learned after being a Christian right now for about 37 years. Sometimes challenges will come and they'll last for a short time. But for some of us, we will face challenges that will last a very long time. And when those times come, I'm telling you, your faith will be tested. You know, in about 2003, when we were going through a lot of crisis as a movement and as a church, there was a lot of stress. And uh, something started to happen as far as my wife's health was concerned. You know, she started to develop rashes on her skin. And uh, at first we didn't, you know, think very much of it. But as time went by, it started to spread. And then Karen got it diagnosed and, and then the doctor told her that she has psoriasis. And, um, you know, psoriasis can be extremely challenging. There is no cure for it. You know, and when certain things triggers you, your skin just flares up and it's extremely, extremely uncomfortable. And then on top of that, she had to be very careful about what she eats. And you know, from that time on, I remember things just changed in, in our lifestyle. Um, you know, prior to that, we could go to any restaurant, eat anything. After that, I had to learn one thing. I can only go to restaurants that serve the kind of food that only Karen can eat. You know, that actually caused me a lot of frustration. There are times I'll get so uh, annoyed. And I remember praying to God, God, okay, you've let her have this. Okay, it's it's been long enough. Can you take it away? Here's the thing. 
I, I wish I could tell at the end of the story, Karen is completely cured. But you know what? She still has survived. How many years has it been? It's been a long time. And I realized, you know what? God's probably doing that to teach me some things, to teach Karen something. And the one thing I know I've learned through all this is this. Learn to think a lot more about what Karen needs. Learn to not just think about what you want. When you go, when you want to find a place to eat, don't just think about what you want. You know, it may be a small thing, but that has been a huge thing for me. I am not going to decide ultimately what I want. I have to really take Karen's feelings into account. That's what I've learned. And I want to ask you this, brothers and sisters. Do you have an ongoing challenge that have stayed with you for about a decade, maybe even longer? How do you feel? Is Jesus still the Lord of your life? Are you still as fervent as ever before? You know, if you falter in times of trouble, and by the way, we all do, but there has to come a point where we have to just pick ourselves up. Are you with me? And I know challenges can get us down. We all have, you know, we all have been tripped, but there comes a point where you have to just stand up because the question is this, if you're only going to make Jesus the Lord of your life when times are good, then think about it. That's like saying to God, I just want to be on your side in, so that life can be good. Now, how do you feel if someone uses you or wants to be close to you or wants to be your friend because they know by doing so, another door will be open for them. You know, you, you thought they liked you for who you are, and then finally you realize, oh my goodness, they're using me. How does that make you feel? I know I don't like that feeling when I, when I you know, get that. How do you think God feels being used? God, thank you so much for this. Oh, you bless my life with all this thing. But then one day when he gets taken away, you know, all of a sudden we lose everything. We don't want to be close to God anymore. You see, that's the real test of who is the I am in your life. Let's borrow that phrase from John the prophet and apply it during these difficult times and say, I am not the Lord. Right, now let's move on and talk about the interplay of those words between Jesus and Peter. Now let's turn right now to chapter 18 of the book of John, starting in verse 2. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priest and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I. And he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. 
Interesting. I never realized this before, but notice how clearly Jesus used this phrase, I am. John records it three times. I am, I am, I am. Clear. No ambiguity. I am Jesus of Nazareth. Now, later on in that same chapter, let's read in verse 25. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not one of the high priest's servants. A relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Now, look at this incident. What did Peter say? It's interesting how John phrased it. Three times now, Peter says, I am not. I am not. Earlier in the chapter, three times Jesus says, I am. So when we see the interplay of I am and I am not between Peter and Jesus, this time, you know what we realize? We've got to emulate Jesus. And if there is a need to take a stand for our faith, if there is a need to take a stand for our values, we need to just come out courageously like Jesus without ambiguity and say, I am. But sometimes we falter under pressure because of fear, because of perhaps a desire to please others. And then we say, I am not. I am not. Only to regret. It. You know, this reminds me of a story of my son when he went to uh, to uh, camp when he was uh, recruited for the national service. You know, like all parents, we were we were in anxiety. You know, wondering how he would do because, as you know, especially brothers, that things can get pretty rough. Okay, uh, as a, as a young recruit, and uh, after several weeks, David came back, and you know. His hair was all shaved. And I asked him, and he said, Dad, I, I've never been tested like I have been during this time. And I asked him to tell me what happened. And he said, the thing is that every day in the morning, we had to wake up super early. I got up half an hour earlier, and I did my quiet time. But he said, that was not the hardest part. The hardest part was, when we all were about to go to sleep, we will be having all kinds of trash talk. And the whole camp started to debate with me on whether or not, you know, I should have sex before marriage. And that whole subject came up. And everybody in that, in that, area, in, in that dormitory went after David. I don't think that they didn't have a, a fight or anything, but you know, you know how boys would talk and they would talk about why he should do it and how dumb he was for not, for not doing it. And why would he want to hold on to that position? You know, what is so amazing is that I was very, very proud of David. David took a stand right till the end. He never compromise. He had to come out in the open and say, I am a Christian. I am. 
And sometimes, brothers and sisters, we have to do the same. And I think under pressure, we sometimes get silent. And we say, well, I didn't say I am, but I also didn't say I am not. And you're in the middle. I just got to tell you, if you're silent, you basically said, I am not. If you're tempted to lie at work, cut corners, I want to encourage you, come out, speak your mind, do so respectfully, and, and let your Christianity shine. Taking a stand and going to church, that's something you all need to do. The Bible expects us, you know, in the future when the measures ease up and we get to meet, I hope we'll all be there because we love God and that we're willing to take a stand against people who don't hold on to the same values. you got to come out and say, like Jesus, I am. So, Brothers and sisters, how are you doing in this area? How are you doing in this area? I want to close out with a story about an early church father who lived in the mid-second century. His name was Polycarp. And uh, history says that he died around 155 to 160 AD. Okay? or maybe even a tad earlier. But he was a leader of the church in Smyrna, which today is located in modern-day Turkey. Now, I'm going to read you okay, excerpts uh, of this ancient text that was written about how he gave up his faith. And he came out in the open and declared, who he was. So here are the excerpts, okay, of uh, what people believed he said. When they captured Polycarp, they tried very hard to get him to deny Christ. But this was what Polycarp was recorded as having said. 86 years I have been his servant, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Once more, the proconsul urged Polycarp to swear by Caesar. This time, Polycarp replied, since you pretend not to know who and what I am, hear me declare with boldness, I am a Christian. And if you wish to learn more about Christianity, I will be happy to make an appointment. Furious, the pro council said, Don't you know that I have wild beasts waiting? I'll throw you to them unless you repent. Polycarp answered, Bring them on then, for we are not accustomed to repent or what is good in order to adopt that which is evil. According to observers, they then lit up the flames. They tied him to a pole and they lit up flames around him. But interestingly enough, the flames did not consume Polycarp's body as expected. So the fire circled around him but his body did not burn. And since the fire did not have its intended effect on Polycarp, an executioner was ordered to stab him to death with a dagger. And his blood extinguished the flames. Wow. I am the Christ. 
democracy. That's what Paul Trump said. I want to ask you right now, brothers and sisters, are you proud of having that name? Christian. Do you wear it? Do you, do, do, do you hold on to those values? You know? I, I am a Christian. Do you, do, do, do you profess it when there is a need? Now, I'm not saying we profess it without being invited. And I don't think that's helpful. That could turn a lot of people off. But trust me, as you lead your godly life in Christ Jesus, you will be called upon to profess your Christianity. And I hope in those occasions, you will say like Jesus, without ambiguity, I am. Thank you, everybody. And I hope this lesson has been helpful. Thank you, John, for your awesome lesson. I've learned that I am not God and that I can place my trust in Him, the unchanging God. And so many times, I need to personally sort out my thoughts and my life so that God will remain the one true God in my life and I will follow His will. Right now, we will partake the communion together. Let's take a moment to prepare our bread and wine. Let's pray for the bread and wine. Dear God, thank you, God, for speaking to us today through the sermons and the scriptures. Thank you for Jesus dying on the cross so that we can have this relationship with you. We are so grateful that you are the great I am. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. We are grateful to be able to recall you, our Father, and we are your son and daughters. Thank you for the bread that represents Jesus' body and the wine that represents Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sin. Please help us to meditate on, our, on your words and draw closer to you in the coming week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right now, let's meditate upon the cross as an instrumental piece is being played. Now is the time to take up the collection for the poor. Thank you for your kind generosity. During the song that follows, you will see a graphic showing the breakdown of how our church distributes the donations we collect. Now, let's take up our church collection for the poor. What a beautiful name is What a 
what a beautiful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name so much for joining us today. I hope you have enjoyed our worship service. Now is the time for some announcements. As mentioned, we will be starting the Quiet Time series, The Great I Am, as a whole church. Consisting of 21 sessions, each session can easily be read over two days. We encourage you to share your insights with your small groups. The PDF file for the Quiet Time series is available on our church website, that is centralchristianchurch.sg Next, our upcoming I Choose Us Marriage Workshop will be on 24th to 26th July, Friday to Sunday. It is a free webinar focusing on helping married couples build love connections in our marriages by breaking harmful cycles. Do take note of the timing for each session and that it is only for married couples residing in Singapore. Let's be inviting our friends and get them to register early. Thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye, stay safe, and God bless.